Good evening, welcome back to Go Open, but don't settle down because we're about to go uh, to a place where all the Lebanese people's friends live. It's called Chana. Uh, then we're also going to meet the Translate organization. There are people who are making computing accessible to all sorts of different people in the masses from different language groups. And then we're going to play backgammon with a blue wildebeest, or should I say GNU. Go open source software exists as a result of the combined efforts of millions of computer programmers, users and software vendors from around the world. They share their intellectual property freely and they believe that software should cost nothing and should enrich the lives of users. Open source software is the alternative and biggest challenger to closed source or proprietary software. It generally costs the user nothing. It can be distributed freely to anyone. Download it, use it, modify it, and give it away. It's a whole new world. Open source is the future of computing. This week, first up, China, a country that really is fantastic. A billion people can't be wrong. The economic and industrial growth is second to none, which means it's first, really. IT is part of that growth. And would you believe it? Open source is already there. China a cultural melting pot and the new superpower emerging from the East. Not only is it challenging the world economically, but it's also taking on the computing world with its new Linux operating system called Red Flag. Vincent Mao of Rhodes University Media Studies has taken an in-depth look at this phenomenon. Red Flag is a really good looking operating system. It's been designed specifically to entice users from Windows XP. So it feels very crisp, it's fast, it looks beautiful. I think the users will use it or consider it as one of the best distros of Linux on the market. Why is there a need for a Chinese Linux distro? Initially I think <clears throat> the route that they were taking was to move away from the restrictive licensing of Microsoft products um, and to take control of that operating system and what they achieve by doing that is that they they can develop issues like national pride around owning their own software um, they can incorporate specifically Chinese aspects into the software, like the character sets, the language aspects of the software. Um, and there are certain, probably specific requirements that Chinese software users would have, which are not necessarily common to Western users. To what extent is the Chinese government currently using open source? Within the Chinese government, the, the servers are all, all Linux. I mean, that, that is sort of by government decree. According to Vincent, American software companies have traditionally not paid attention to the rest of the world's development needs until now. But with China having such a large market share and taking control of their own software development, there may be a shift from east to west. You may find that those kind of movements from China into the Western world will come through their development partners, um, companies like Oracle, like Hewlett Packard, will, will begin to migrate more of these products outwards. China has turned its back on proprietary software for a number of reasons, but their growing concern is that there could be hidden Trojan programs in proprietary software that could be used to spy on them. When Microsoft releases a patch, spyware can be one kilobyte in size, something that's so small that the user won't even notice it downloading. So let's say that you know today they show them the source, the source may not be the same in, in a couple of weeks' time. So through China developing their own distro, they can have a larger control over what information is being sent through? They currently control the way that the information flows on the internet. Um, they cannot control, for instance, if they widely use Microsoft operating systems, they cannot control the code and the way that that operating system works on the desktop. To undertake a, a mission to actually control and manage the, the desktop environment is something that probably is even beyond their reach um, in terms of their physical capacity. On the flip side, what's stopping the Chinese government embedding their own spyware? There is really nothing stopping them. I guess it's a matter of <clears throat> where they want to go with this thing. If they want to use it as a tool of control, they probably could. And they have no qualms about controlling the mass media, television, radio. So one would think that it, it would be vaguely on their agenda to look into that kind of, kind of control. As it is at the moment, they have massive filters on what kind of internet content you could access. An awareness of Asian solidarity is sweeping the region. 
Recently, Singapore's Ministry of Defense switched 20,000 personal computers to use open source software. With the release of Asianux, the first version was released quite recently and they've moved ahead the schedule for the second version of the release. And that's a, a system developed jointly by, by Red Flag in China, by Hansoft in South Korea, and by Miracle Linux in Japan. With the world's most populous nation using open source, Linux devotees say there's no stopping world domination. It could threaten the existing software conglomerates and set new standards for the rest of the world. It will threaten them because the, the alternative is a free version of what at some point will become an equally competitive and capable software application. So the choice between paying for something and getting it for free is an easy one to make. The free and open source operating system Linux is getting more and more well known. Um, but what isn't known is that it was a collaborative effort of hundreds and hundreds of people who worked uh, without pay to make it what it is today. Anyway, I'm sure you'd like to meet one of the men responsible for a large part of the work on the kernel. First of all, let's go into your history a bit. Uh, you were heavily involved in the development of the Linux kernel since its early days. Exactly what was your involvement in that? Um, initially, I was involved with the games industry, and I had a multiplayer game I was writing. I needed something more stable than Windows to run it on. And so I, I sort of accidentally ended up trying to run it on Linux very early on. Linux wasn't good enough, so I started fixing bugs, improving Linux, making it do the things I wanted. And eventually I got hired by Red Hat, and I now work full-time professionally on the Linux operating system. What exactly is Red Hat in terms of Linux? If you look on the internet, there are millions and millions of pieces of software of variable quality. They don't always work together. So a lot of our job is putting these pieces together in a package people can use. To an average man, what can Linux do for them? It can give them an environment they are in control of. So, for example, um, large companies have looked, for example, in South Africa at things like Zulu and said, oh, there's not enough money in this to justify translation. With open source software like OpenOffice, people have actually been able to go out there and say, we don't care if a large American company thinks I need Zulu on my desktop. I can have Zulu on my desktop. Do you find support with regards to the open source world to be on a, on a number of levels uh, compared to proprietary software support? It's on a very wide variety of levels. Um, that's actually really important because with a lot of proprietary software, if you go and you want support, there is only one support vendor. With Linux, I can, for example, go to Red Hat and say, I want 24 by 7 support. I want really high-end business support and I'll pay for it. At the same time, I can also go down the road to the university, find an undergraduate and say, can you fix this? this bug for me. It's really annoying and our, our vendor isn't interested. So not only is there a wide selection of support and options, but I as the customer get to pick rather than the supplier dictating what the support terms are. Fascinating. Wow. Anyway, just now we're going to find out about uh, computing in other languages. So, you know, Hakuna Matata and La Bamba. And uh, then we're going to meet a guy who's local, but he's a geek. So he's like a geek. Imagine when you switched on your computer, it spoke a foreign language. So instead of going, hello, I'm Bob the computer, it went, ha. Well, that's how most Africans feel when they switch on a computer because it only speaks English. Everything should be translated for people who don't. For example, a Khoisan computer could go, and that's a double click. To promote computer literacy in a country where there is a high rate of illiteracy seems like wanting to run before you can walk. Yet for those who are semi-literate, a computer can open up worlds of communication and productivity. It can also be a tool for education and upliftment. The computer is just a tool. So if it's just a tool, then it must change to people. And my feeling is, why should you have to learn English at all to be able to use computers? The Germans and the French don't feel like that. So why should we have a mama who all, all she wants to do is email her child at university from the Eastern Cape? Why must she learn English to be able to email? So it's much easier for us to change the interface to speak closer 
then to get that woman to speak English. Dwayne Bailey is one of the large group of people collaborating worldwide to bring computing to the people. He's not a programmer, merely a volunteer who is passionate about language. Our main focus being open source is that we want this to be driven by volunteers, so people who are passionate about their language and have enough skills. One of those volunteers was Leseho Moset Lanyan, a receptionist at Obsidian Systems. We have an instant messaging system here called Jeba, so you can chat to anyone. You know, so I was chatting with Dwayne, so I like mixing Africans and English together, and he liked the way I mixed languages. He told me about this translation thing, what he's doing, and uh, what my home language is, and if I'll be interested in doing this uh, project with him. I said, yeah, why not? Lesaka completed work on the Tswana version of Open Office last year. It took her six months in her spare time. I had to double check, actually I triple checked. <laughs> the spellings and I use the dictionary so it takes a long time. It may seem like a tall order to translate technical computing terms into languages like Sutu and Afrikaans. We have fights often with translators who say but there is no word for proxy server so we say well what is a proxy server and that's that's unpack it and then work out a word. I mean there are lots of ideas of a proxy you stand in for someone to represent yourself at the king. So in Afrikaans it's called a instan bedina or a stand-in server which is, is, is exactly what it does. Elizabeth Rasitsepa was a cleaner at a college in Mokopane when she heard about the training courses for computer literacy at the HPI community. Now she's found a way to turn her newfound skill into an income generating service. Kadu computer kijia di di CV e na ngo tloga mowe ka printela ba ka gae le nana go la pulo ya maswika e nene ka bo ya ka ba jela me mo ka rata e e le ka rata tsa di teste wa di etsa e tsa lenyalo e i get emails that say things like i'm suddenly proud to be a zulu speaker you've made my language Relevance. I'm proud of it, knowing that I'm leaving a legacy behind. Translation organizations around the world are now recognizing that open source is a way to empower, educate and uplift. With the three languages that we've released, we impact about 55% of the population. We haven't brought computers to them. That's other people are going to have to do that, but we've taken away one of the barriers. So we, we like to see those stats where we actually are making a difference. Now that everyone in our country will be able to understand what's going on in computers, what are we going to do with it? So in order to tell us that, probably the biggest gun we've had locally, I would imagine, uh, our next guest is a doctor, and he's also a general manager uh, in research and development at the state IT agency. Let's meet Dr. McKay Mochabi. Hello, Doctor. Hello, John. How, How are, are you doing? Thank you very much for coming down. I'm doing very well. Thank you for inviting us. First of all, Doctor, what is CETA? CETA is a state IT agency that is charged with deploying IT products and services in the government. And our role is to ensure that government realizes cost reduction, it realizes return on investment in its IT. Government's chosen to, to look at open source? That's correct. What were the reasons behind that, that decision? Is government interested in return on investment? Yes, def gov def government definitely is interested in return on investment. Is government interested in cost reduction? Yes, government is interested in cost reduction, etc. All of those in one package, are they available in open source? Are they available in proprietary platforms? Well, our argument is that they are more available in open source than they are available in proprietary platforms. So I mean cost is a thing, but it's, not, it's, it's certainly not uh, the main thing. The government of South Africa today spends 18 billion rands a year on IT. Six billion of that is estimated to be on software, which obviously is related to licenses as well, over and above the purchasing of the software. What is the vision of the government with regard to this kind of enormous project to this whole agency dedicated to putting IT into use? We're looking at taking 60,000 seats within government and studying what the total cost of acquisition, total cost of ownership and uh, maintenance and services would look like if one were to migrate from proprietary to uh, open source. But on the other hand, we're also doing demonstrator projects. We have just recently, together with our partners, built a corruption management database for the Department of Public Service and Administration. But the most exciting project that we just did that actually 
actually deals with open source is one who, uh, at Helen Joseph's uh, Hospital, where we actually gave nurses and doctors and all health practitioners around an application on their personal cell phone that makes them access a patient record in five seconds. And that whole system is built around open source. Next stop is home affairs. By the end of February, uh, we would have completed a pilot that allows a citizen to actually query on the status of their application for an ID or an application for a passport. Thank you very much for joining us. That's Best more of luck. like democracy. Open source, it's democratic. We have proof now from the general manager. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Right, are you an open source boffin? Now there's a qualification you can get online that will tell everyone else that you really are an open source boffin. Go to www.icdl.org and look for the open source link and get certified. Uh, that's the International Computer Drivers License. You can hang that anywhere and it's very exciting and, uh, and your computer will never get fined. So that's lovely. Coming up next, backgammon with NU. That's G-N-U. Uh, it's a whole new way of playing with your dice. Yeah, very good. See you after this. We've talked about it, we've seen it done, and now it's time for you to go and try to do it. That's right, install Linux on your PC. And if you don't back up the stuff you wanna keep, then don't come crying to us. Let's talk to Mark, because he is the Ubuntu man. Today we're doing it with Linux. Linux is the fastest growing open source operating system. So once you install Linux on a PC, you're running open source software from the metal of the PC all the way up to all of your applications. So we're going to show you from step one how you would go about installing a version of Linux called Ubuntu on a brand new PC. Before you start, write down all you can find out about your installed hardware. If you want to keep Windows on the same computer, you'll have to resize your Windows partition beforehand. First go into the BIOS and set your system to boot from your CD drive. Insert the install CD and start up. You'll be taken through all the steps including partitioning and formatting your hard drive and setting up your various peripherals. Depending on your computer, you should have Ubuntu up and running in well under an hour. I believe that Linux is the future of desktop computing. So if you can understand Linux and get experience with Linux today, then you're setting yourself up for a fantastic career in computing. So go on, do it, do it. You know you want to, you know you like it. You've got nothing to lose and so much to learn. If you want to find out anything about the program, in the program or around the program, go straight to our website, www.goopensource.org and uh, you can ask us anything. We'll even tell you how they make Poloni. Just kidding. Anyway, you can also find out how to own the entire series on DVD, 312 minutes for 199 Rand. It's hot IT action. And now it's time to pick up your dice and because this is a family show, we won't look at your front gammon, we're going to play back gammon. Backgammon is a game of skill and chance where two players take turns to move 15 tokens around a board based on the roll of the dice. The first to remove all his pieces wins. The origins of the game can be traced back 5,000 years to ancient Iran or Persia. The modern game has evolved somewhat and like so many other things has moved on to the internet. The good thing about playing on a computer is that you can play any time of the night um, because you're fundamentally playing people from all over the world. You can be playing someone from New Zealand one game, and you can be playing someone from pop out of the next game. But you don't have to go online. The GNU Backgammon project now allows you to play on your computer against a system with highly evolved artificial intelligence. Certainly a program like GNU, which uses a neural net algorithm, how that, that's distinguished from, a, from an old style um, program is that it learns, it can learn. And in fact, a very substantial part of programming that bot is its training. Like a child, you need to teach it. GNU Backgammon runs on a variety of operating systems and is an invaluable tool in learning the game. Many say it is superior to commercial equivalents. The other softwares which are available are actually quite expensive. There's um, Snowy, which is around $400, and there's also Jellyfish, which is a little bit less, at about $200. Well, it certainly has a number of very um, impressive and powerful features to analyze uh, your game. It means that, you know, a lot more people have a lot more access to backgammon um, and advanced um, expert level backgammon. Oh, that Rafilwa girl has been calling the web all week. Oh, just hate that kind of behavior on the web. We'll start off with a site that's quite delicious, literally. There's a new phenomenon at del.ico.us. 
that's the word, delicious with dots in between. The phenomenon is called social bookmarking. Basically, it allows you to share your internet browsing bookmarks folder with a whole community of people with similar interests to yours. You're also able to share their bookmarks. Delicious lets you store and categorize your internet bookmarks online, giving you cross-links between topics and even people. Find out how many other people posted the same link as you, follow which links they posted, or look at all the links that have been submitted. Considering moving across to Linux, one Linux link you're likely to find useful is www.linux.co.za. Here you'll find dozens of local Linux success stories and case studies. You'll be amazed at how many companies have already crossed over to open source software and the crazy ways they're using it. Most useful though is that you can find a case study that matches the profile of your business and find out how they did it. If you're pondering on the merits of shifting to Linux, you've probably got a whole load of software that only runs on Windows. Now, there is a free Windows emulator on Linux, and it's called Wine. Frankscorner.org gives you all the lowdown on how to set up Wine for various games and applications. With step-by-step -step instructions, Frankscorner.org is an important resource for figuring out how to get your current applications running properly. To recap, you can surf to del.ico.us to get a taste of socialized internet browsing. Go to www.linux.co.za to find local stories about Linux migrations and its uses. And you're welcome to go to frankscorner.org to tuck into some good wine, the Windows emulator, and ease your migration to Linux. In our final episode next week, we're giving away the grand prize, a super duper uber prize, uh, just to prove how generous we can be if the mood takes us. Nothing less than an HP laptop computer. Oh yes, shiny. Mm. So be sure to tune in for that one. Uh, this week we have our fantastic usual prizes, an HP photo smart printer and camera bundle, two LG DVD writers, uh, and a 17 inch flat screen monitor from LG as well. 2000 Rand gift vouchers from Soviet. Uh, just answer the simple question. China's Linux distribution is called A, Red Cow Linux, B, Red Flag Linux, or C, Simply Red Linux. Send your answer just A, B, or C, uh, plus your name to 34357 and you'll be charged two rand per SMS. And the winners of last week's competition are... Dion Kion wins the 17-inch LG monitor for his PC. Clinton de Klerk and Anna-Marie Boerter each get an LG DVD writer. Jackie Lemon and Amanda Gower each win a 1,000 rand Soviet voucher. And Neville January wins the HP camera and printer bundle. Congratulations to all of you. Next week, the final episode of this season of Go Open. We're not sure if we'll be back. So please watch, because also we will be answering that question everyone's been asking us forever, since the beginning of time and even before. How do you make money from open source? Watch next week and we'll tell you, as well as giving away a fantastic laptop from Hewlett Packard, which has got a bit of Hewlett in and a bit of Packard, and together they make a flappy thing. It's fantastic. Until next time, we'll see you, uh, but you, 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 you'll see us. We won't see you, but you'll see us, and that's really what counts. So until then, just don't blink.